guys, it's me, Leilani Joy, and I'm finally back with another episode of The Paint Along. And I know it's been a long time since I've done one of these videos. I've done a couple of live streams, but not that many. And let's face it, I haven't had a lot of painting videos in general lately. Um, and that's because uh, lately, some of you guys know a little bit about this from my uh, Instagram and social media, but life has sort of been smacking me in the face the last uh, probably six to nine months, actually. Um, so not to get uh, too personal about everything, um, but I, it's just been a lot, frankly. Um, I lost uh, my uncle to a car accident back in December, which has been really hard on my whole family. It was sudden and unexpected. Um, and then my 99 year old grandma, who I'm very, very close to, I grew up with my whole life. She really began to decline these last few months and then she passed away. Um, and then my pet Boo, my guinea pig passed away. <laughs> he was sick and I was nursing him and this is all kind of going on at the same time. And then my other guinea pig, Bam, he started growing a tumor on him. So he had to go back and forth to the vet. And then finally, as a beautiful cherry on this um, dramatic life cake lately, is I've been having some severe abdominal pain. I can't say that word, abdominal, abominable, abominable snowman. And yeah, so I've been back and forth to, to the doctor, kind of trying to figure out what's going on. Um, they have a couple ideas, but we don't really know yet. So most of the time I'm kind of in like crampy pain and been sad on top of it. So anyways, not to unload on you guys too much, but that's kind of just how it is sometimes. I know there's just like a lot comes at you at once. And I feel very fortunate that I have a wonderful support system, a husband that loves me and supports me very much, parents, sister, friends, family, you guys have sent me lovely, wonderful messages and thank you so much for that. Um, but it's been rough on me. I'm a very like optimistic, positive person and lately it's been a little bit challenging for me to kind of like uh, get motivated and feel positive when all this stuff is kind of hitting me. But anyway, I'm kind of crawling out of my, my little dark place a little bit. I have a fabulous commission that I'm in the middle of. I'm gonna show you guys in a second. And it's really kind of been distracting me to get back into painting. So I feel very fortunate that I have art in my life uh, for this particular reason. It's a great escapism to kind of just go into something and concentrate. Um, so yeah, anyways, <laughs> sorry for the uh, Debbie Downer intro. Maybe that's why I'm feeling kind of like in my like goth um, emo look today. Is this lipstick too dark? I don't know, it feels like a little dead. Anyways, that's how I feel inside. Um, <laughs> so anyways, I opened up my questions for you guys to ask me some questions on my Instagram and uh, Facebook, Patreon, and Twitter. And you had some great questions. So I figured I'm gonna do a paint along today. I would do it live, but I'm a little bit disorganized and since I don't know when I can get set up and when I might have to collapse and, and paint and cry over there. So I figured I'd record this uh, for you and hopefully you guys can create along with me. If you guys are going through rough stuff right now, you know, just know you're not alone. And um, I have my fabulous little grandma here with me today. She was just the cutest lady ever. I loved her so very much and her positive energy. She was the most positive person ever, no matter what was going on. She's like, well, can always be worse and you know put a, put your makeup on take a walk go outside so i'm like i'm wearing my makeup and my lipstick for you today grandma because that's what she would want me to do don't wallow and feel sorry for yourself so anyway let's take a look at what i'm working on i'll put you guys up on the uh, painter cam uh, lj's painting cam and get to your questions so let's have at it so here we have it. Here's uh, my commission. You can't see the whole thing because it's actually really big. It doesn't fit on the uh, camera here. So I'll show you uh, a zoomed out view. Um, this is the largest painting I've done in a long time. This is an 18 by 24. Um, my client actually wanted to go even bigger, but I'm like, I I don't really have the, like, the studio space to paint really huge. Anyway, so my client wanted something that was um, Elsa ish <laughs> elsa adjacent we'll call it so snow queen meets viking those kind of kind of themes maybe a little daenerys as well i definitely was like uh feeling that fantasy when i was doing the sketches of this so um 
it looks ba a pretty um, basic at this point, but if you guys can see this, let me see if I can show you. I've spent a good amount of time um, with the initial masking of the skirt. So I have a pretty elaborate design that I cut out um, and spray painted over the top. So that's actually on there and we will peel that uh, near the end and we'll show like this uh, beautiful pattern work that I did. Um, but for today, I think we'll just kind of work on a few details, maybe start to block in her face a little bit. Okay, I think that's in focus now. Now this is probably a little bit skewed for you guys at an angle, so sorry about that. It's just that I have, as you can see, I've tilted up my, um, cause I can't bend that far over. This is a little bit trickier to film cause it's larger. Um, so hopefully you guys can at least see that. So I want to do this, like, I want her crown to kind of be like iron feeling like, um, metal. So I'm going to kind of just start with blocking it in with, um, some just kind of like middle gray. All right. So I'm going to mask this off a little bit. It doesn't have to be too perfect, but it makes it go a little bit faster. All right, so my first question today comes from Instagram, and it's from Brandy Fabiano. Beautiful, Brandy Fabiano, beautiful name. Um, and she asks, have you ha ever had any scary experiences living in San Fran? Um, so first of all, it's fun fact. This is like not totally not a read to you at all, Brandy. But um, one of the like the quickest ways to know someone is not from the Bay Area or from San Francisco is if you use the term San Fran. I know this is weird, but we don't say that. Like no one ever says San Fran. I don't know why it like totally makes sense, but it's just like a thing that like local people don't don't say Frisco, don't say San Fran. It's either San Francisco or the city, the city. We just call it the city. So I don't know. So it's like, I can always kind of like clock someone who's not like from here. If they go like, oh, how's, how's Frisco? I'm like, no, no one says that. Anyways, sorry, Brandy, just, just fun fact for you. I, so I, I have, unfortunately, um, and San Francisco lately has gotten scarier than ever, which is like really sad to me because I, I loved it. It was truly one of my favorite places when I, when I was growing up and I always wanted to go to San Francisco and I always, I wanted to go to Japantown, which is still one of my favorite places, but as many of you guys know, it's there's been just this sad decline, uh, increase in homeless population, drugs, um, crime. It's just like it's gotten kind of sketchy and like dirty and it's sad. It's really a bummer. But as far as scary stories, um, one, one of them I like to tell, which is which is funny. When I first moved to San Francisco by myself for college, I was, you know, I was nervous. I hadn't been away from home and I grew up in sort of like Sacramento is like kind of, um, I lived actually outside of Sacramento in a smaller kind of suburban area. So I was not like city smart, so to speak. So I'd gotten my, um, my city muni pass, my bus pass. And I was like, okay, I'm going to take the buses. And I read the schedules and I figured out how to do everything. And so what, like <laughs> one of my first weeks being there, I got off the bus because I was going to go do some thrift store shopping and there's a man like I can tell like a man walking sort of close to me like behind me you know how you get like just that sense it's like somebody's following cl too close and so I started walking faster and then he started walking faster and then I kind of started like running a little bit because I was like oh my god why is this guy like getting up on me and so I was getting really nervous so I started running and then he started running and I was like okay and I'm gonna die on my first week in the city I'm gonna die and he's like oh wait 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 and I was like oh god like what does he want and I finally turned around and he's like you drop your bus pass like I know it's worth like 60 bucks and I was like oh oh my god I'm such a jerk like he probably thought I was a complete weirdo although he should have just said hey ma'am you drop your bus pass or something because I didn't know why he was sort of chasing me but anyway so that was like a fake scary story um but as far as real scary stories I unfortunately had a couple of other incidents uh with creepy men <laughs> always seems to be the case right um, one time I was, I used to work late at the mall after, um, after my classes. So I wouldn't get off till like 11 or so sometimes. 
and then I would take a bus home and then walk to my apartment and there was one night this guy like came out of a bar older guy and I think he was pretty intoxicated not that that excuses it but it was kind of a similar thing he started following me and I was like okay I know he's following me um it was creepy like when I would speed up he would speed up and then I was like oh my god well I'm almost in my house and then I had like I had like a gated entry so I was like if I can just get inside the gate obviously there's nothing you can do I actually took my pepper spray out because this time I was pretty nervous that this guy was like maybe gonna do something so I have my pepper spray in one hand so I'm like if he even like reaches out or anything I'm just gonna like spray him in the face um so I got into my gate and he just grabbed the bars of the gate and just like stared me down and I was like what the f what do you want and he just he just stood there and I went in my building, which in hindsight, they say you really shouldn't go home, like, because if that person, then they know where you live. So it's better to like go, go in a convenience store or something and say, I need help. This person's following me. But I was literally like within one block of my house when he started following me. So I was like, I don't really want to like turn around. So yeah, and I, I had, a, I've had a couple other instances of things similar to that, unfortunately. So I think I, I actually, I have moved since moved out of the city. I'm still in the Bay Area, but I don't live in San Francisco anymore, partially because of some of these reasons, partially because of the rent being too high. And it's just I don't know. There's definitely like some sketchy things that happen. And I don't I don't miss that. I really I really don't. And I have friends that still are holding out in the city. And it's like they have to step over tents and step over syringes and drugs and it's just sad. I'm like, and you're paying $5,000 a month for your apartment. And it's like, got like human excrement on your door, you know. Anyways, I digress about that. I, I really hope our new governor and new mayor actually care about this stuff and might actually restore San Francisco to its former glory because there are so many cool, quirky, awesome things about it. But I, I feel bad, though, because the more and more I hear about people visiting, they're like, oh, it's kind of gross. And I'm like, yeah, it really is. I'm sorry about that. It's a bummer. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I have a few other funny stories I could tell you another time. The scary ones aren't that fun, but I, I have a few. <laughs> one that was about a guy who had a pigeon in a shoebox, you know, one guy who had a five inch toenail. That was a fun story as well. <laughs> I can elaborate next time if you want. Oh, sorry, getting a pain. Okay, um, 13th artist. What did you think of the Game of Thrones finale? <laughs> From one to 10, worst to amazeballs. <laughs> oh God, well, I don't know how deep I wanna get into this here. Um, I figure most of you guys who are probably fans of the show have watched it already, but I guess I will say spoilers at this point and if you want to jump ahead of this question I'll put a timestamp right there so uh, you can skip over this or if you don't watch Game of Thrones you don't care um, I'm not gonna like go into like a big old spiel over it because I think some people have already done that and done that well um, there's a couple of uh, um, bloggers I like that had really broken it down I'll, I'll have to put their names down here there was someone on, I shared on my discord on Patreon that I thought she just like hit all of hit all of my opinions really well. Um, there's a guy named Mahler. Uh, he's like an entertainment blogger, and I also kind of agreed with him. He's really funny. Um, okay, so are we, by finale do you mean the last episode or do you mean the last season? Um, because I think the season for me and I think for most people kind of was like, okay, okay, what? No, oh, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> that's kind of like how it was for me. Um, I guess in a, in a short version, I, I didn't like it. Um, I'm definitely in the camp who was very disappointed as far as like worse one to 10, I feel like uh because i really it really lost me at like episode four and five i thought those were the worst um i thought episode six was okay um i still didn't like it um but i think that was partially because they had already ruined it for me um i hated what they did with daenerys i thought it was nonsensical um i know a lot a lot of people have tried to explain to me otherwise like oh she was crazy the whole time and all this but i'm like 
but she was never not acting logically. Like, I told someone else this. I was like, I agree that she was, like, ruthless at times, but she never was, like, in her own mind doing things just out of, like, a sick desire for power, if that makes sense. Because I started rewatching the show, actually, because of this. Because I'm like, I really kind of need to, like, revisit this. Because some people were saying, oh, no, she was always mad, so to speak. And I did. I rewatched several of... Uh, I kind of started from season three or four. And I was like, I mean, she was, like, pretty much always either having her life threatened or, like, threatening her with bodily harm or they were doing horrible things to people. And then she acted on what she thought was right and just for that. Did she make mistakes? Yeah, there were times where it was like definitely ethically questionable, but she never killed innocents just to kill them. I just, I don't buy that. And I feel like it was very lazy and um, uh, frankly cruel to do to that character because I was a big Daenerys fan. Um, and, and I don't, I don't mind that it has a tragic ending. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I know that sometimes, um, heroes become villains. I'm fine with that. Like, you know, Breaking Bad, I think is always like the gold standard as far as like someone you root for. And then you go, oh my God, you're just so horrible. I don't support anything you do. And I think they could have done that with Daenerys, but they, they definitely waited way too long, um, to, to develop that into her character. It was so rushed. It was so out of the blue that I was just shaking my head. I was like, what the hell? What? I don't get it. I don't get it. I was very, I, I said I wasn't going to go too far into this, but I'm super frustrated with character arcs in general. I thought I hated what they did with Jamie. I hated what they did with Cersei. I thought that was such a waste of, honestly, I would be fine if Cersei won. You know, if that was the ending, she actually outsmarted everyone and she was so desperate and brutal for the sake of her unborn child that she just killed everyone in King's Landing and Daenerys gets hit with the or her, kills her last dragon and she gives up you know what I mean and it could have been a totally somber ending but I somehow would have found that more satisfying I think I just I was just left with like ugh like I was just not John was a non-character he literally had nothing intelligent to offer or say Tyrion was like completely written out of like his character is his character really probably died in like season six like he just had nothing intelligent to do or say Varys ended up being stupid and I was like I was like Varys was like literally the one character that I thought should be at the end because he was so smart he's like a cockroach like he would survive anything and like at the very end he's like oh hey want to commit treason let's do it oh obviously I'm gonna get burned up like I just I can't so anyway that's my two cents on it I can talk more about it. I opened up a thread on this on my um, uh, on my uh, Discord. So if you guys are my Patreon subscribers, I have a private Discord chat, and I, we can discuss more of it over there. But yeah, for me, it was a, it was a bummer, and I really like I'm sad about it. It was uh, if you guys are Mass Effect players, it was a Mass Effect three ending for me. It just totally dropped the ball, and it really hurt the series as far as I'm concerned because it's kind of hard for me to like forget that. So, I don't know. I, I think if they needed it, they should have taken two more seasons, draw, drew it out. I don't know. It just seemed like they wanted to get it over with, and that's exactly what it felt like. Um, props to the visuals, though. Thought that they looked amazing. I particularly love that shot of the dragon opening up behind Daenerys. I thought that was gorgeous. I was like, oh, that looks fabulous. I just wish that there was some like something that I cared about at this point behind it. Anyway, I don't know. Let let me know what you guys think. I know I I'm I might be like totally disagreeing with some of you cuz I I have a lot of friends who are like I loved it. It was great. And I'm just like I didn't I don't know. I'm I was a big fan of the show and I don't really see how it it just feels very detached from what the show was, I guess. I felt like it was a completely different show. So I'm curious, like, if you really, if you liked it, like, how did it pay off for you? Because for me, it just, it didn't really pay off. Even the thing, even the stuff with the Night King was kind of like, oh, I mean, love Arya and everything, but it just didn't fit for me in anybody's arc. Ah, I digress. I probably talked 15 minutes about that. Just that. 
Okay, my husband's here now, so he might be talking in the background. We may or may not, you know, agree with his opinion, but let him have one. You just missed our Game of Thrones discussion, unfortunately. They wanted to know what we thought of the finale, but I think I covered our bases. We were kind of on the same page on that. Uh, okay, but the next question we have is... So you thought it was awesome? I thought it was awesome. He, he loved it. It was his favorite ending of any show ever. Right? I love when characters act like <laughs> they're characters. Yeah, me too. I just they, love that. I love so... when they subvert <laughs> expectations. You know, there's just nothing better than saying, hey, everything you thought and hoped would happen? Well, we're not going to do that. That's I want to get paid half that's... a million dollars to say, I don't want it. I don't want it. You're my queen. You're my queen. Oh, poor Jon Snow. They did him dirty. They did everyone dirty. Okay, anyways, I, I'm bringing you in on this, not to talk about that, but we have a question from, well, I have a question that you can also answer, from Tweety Bard, who wants to know, do you play any games? Who, me? Do I? Oh. Uh, and if so, what is what is my favorite? Now, frankly, you and I, I both know. <laughs> we could probably go on this question for the full hour. So, what do you think it would be easier if, like, we answered this like by category? Because I think I'm at the point now where I can't just pick one game over another if they're not the same type of game. Yes, you can. No. No, you can't because, like, you know, it's like if I have to choose a puzzle game versus an adventure game versus an RPG versus, you know, a shooter or story-based game, that those are different categories. Or side-scroller. Like you, you can only have one game on an island, what would it be? <sighs> God, see, that's so hard, though. Because, like, even, okay. And, and you, have, you have 15 seconds to choose or else you <laughs> 15, get no game. Oh, see, I don't like this I mean, way of answering. Like with I don't like this way of answering. I prefer that I would get to choose one in each category. You got five seconds left. Okay, but if it's a trilogy... Well, it looks like coconuts for you. <laughs> if it's a trilogy, can you have the whole thing? Okay, I know that you're hinting that I would say Mass Effect, and I'm obviously Mass Effect is a big one for me. But which one? If you had to choose only one of them, I mean... You know. Two, I guess? But, like, honestly, I... I mean, you can't romance Garrus in the first one, no, and you but die in the third. So I know, but you're, second. but the romance is actually better in the third one, and there's, I think, more content for the third one. Even though I hate the, I hate the ending. So there's a, some. Sorry, I'm not painting. Okay, so there's some problems with this whole theory because, you know, like if it's gonna be something they're gonna play over and over again forever. Like, that's, I feel like, a different question than just your favorite game in general. You know what I mean? I'm because a burrito. Because, <laughs> fine. Burrito wins. Well, what would you say? How about that? What's your answer? Oh, one game on an island? Well, that's not really the question. It was, like, what are your favorites? Oh, was it plural? I thought it was a single, single game. Well, question. it says, what is a favorite? A favorite. So, technically, so, they, game. they didn't make us pick... You know. I thought it was, what is your favorite video game? Okay, well, it is, what is a favorite <laughs> game? Do you play games? Yes, that is that is a big yes. What is your favorite? I mean, I like I said, I just, I have a favorite, like, in every category, because I, I grew up, like, playing Mario games, obviously, you know, so those are, like, kind of in their own category, I think, too. Like, side-scroller, like, Nintendo, like, I also love you know, Kirby Superstar, but I can't put Kirby Superstar next to Legend of Zelda or Mass Effect. It just doesn't happen. Well, okay, so on my top five list... Oh, I thought it would be on your notes on uh, your it's, computer. Uh, I don't know. Somewhere. Somewhere in there. But, like, well, we had... I think we did two discussions where we were like, what games have you, like, put the most hours into? You know, because that's a whole different discussion, really. Because, like, then I would probably say, you know, like, Fallout 4, I put, I don't know, yeah, like, Fallout 200 hours. Yeah, you put a lot of hours into Witcher. Um, well, technically, every Mass Effect game is over 50 hours. True. Well, yeah. And you played it a couple times, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Well, then, there you go. So that one probably, Mass Effect is probably definitely in there as my favorite ever. you put but... in a ton of hours in Left 4 Dead. 
Well, yeah, exactly. See, then you can't put that in the same category because we really like like shooter games like that we play online with friends. So those games, I mean, I put a lot of hours in Call of Duty, as shocking as that is. I had someone like some like acquaintance I had from high school is like, I never took you for a Call of Duty person. I'm like, why not? I'm an excellent shot. <laughs> I'm Commander Shepard, of course. How did he know you played? I think he's, I don't know, he saw it on my, um, I think we're friends on my Xbox, Xbox account, one. yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, hours, like, I, The Sims, I put, I, I don't know, lifetimes into The Sims back in the day. So, I don't know. But yeah, that's somewhere in there. Like I said, love retro games, grew up on Zelda. Ocarina of Time is still, you know, despite its age, one of my top games ever. I also liked Majora's yeah. Mask. Those games just kind yeah. of live forever. I would love to see them remastered. Somebody, that guy that started doing those on YouTube, those were like, or, or he was Although, doing it on um, I wish in, um, Unity or whatever. The only thing that was disappointed in Majora's Mask he uh, says Mahora. Now, can someone weigh in on that? Because I believe it's Majora. Well, you're also from California, and you spell <laughs> all Spanish oh, here, names wrong. Here we and go. not that Mahora is here Spanish. We, it just sounds like it. It's it's from it's Hyrulean, so it can be whatever I want. You probably also say jalapenos, don't you? Okay, you know what? <laughs> Majora. All right, get into it. Okay, anyways, I don't know if that answered your question because uh, I kind of darted all around, but I love I love video games, so I guess that's why it's very difficult for me. Um, I love those, like, I, I'm, I, I'm sad about Telltale going away because I actually was very attached to their story games, Wolf Among Us in particular and The Walking Dead. I love, like, story games, choice-based story games, so I, I love Life is Strange. I just started Life is Strange 2, which I'm enjoying quite a bit. It's it's not the same, you know. I was pretty attached to the old one. But I love those types of games, too, where, like, your choices affect things. That's probably why I love Mass Effect. Um, and, you know, games like that. Uh, yeah. So, anyway, that's a long-winded answer to your question. Okay, let's get some moody smokiness in these eyes. I love painting the eyes. It's always my favorite thing to get to and I usually like to leave some of it till the end actually because it is my favorite thing to paint so I like to keep it as like a little reward at the end you know although I see some people that like go for the face like very early on they get the face right and then they paint the rest of it which I think makes it kind of like look prettier as it's like developing but I don't know I just I sometimes I feel like I want to get the boring stuff out of the way so that there's like you know <laughs> the juicy center if you will like uh that's how i eat artichokes it's you wait till you get to the good part in the middle uh okay so next uh there's a question from little sweethearts and they want to know what kind of brushes or techniques do you use to create such clean lines sometimes your paintings look so perfect that they look digital how do you do it i absolutely love your work well thank you so much um that's a huge compliment to me because i am um a little bit anal retentive about keeping my paintings clean um, and I've actually perfected this a little bit over the years honestly um, but there's nothing as far as brushes like that's like that's really not a big part of it most of my brushes are like cheapy little brushes that come in like a multi-pack from Michaels so definitely not the brushes um, I do a lot of if you watch my videos I do a lot more um, masking techniques. Um, I really like masking because it can give me, that's really how I get most of the super clean lines that you see, like um, these big shapes, everything, uh, you can't really see it because I'm zoomed in here, but all of this, these big areas, I um, masked off and I used acrylic spray painting techniques. So I usually start with that as a base and then I will paint on top of it to give it a little bit more texture. Um, like certain pieces, it depends how graphic I want to leave it, um, like stylistically. And this one, I, I probably want to have a mix of graphic and painterly areas. So I'm, I, want, I don't want there to be too much contrast between the clean and the more painterly stuff that's like in the background. So I'll kind of like, overlap and mix those two techniques together. Um, 
another thing that helps is for me is I, I don't I don't paint too thickly um, like some people with acrylic paint very like impasto they call it which is like very thick and you see the brush strokes and everything um, I keep mine on the thin side um, not too wet obviously because otherwise it won't stick to your board but I keep it a nice smooth creamy texture so that it kind of flows on there and I can really kind of blend it out um, and that helps it stay kind of clean as well. Um, the other thing that I do is I keep, um, I do lots of layers instead of blending one one area uh, th like thickly, if that makes sense. Because like acrylics, you don't you don't have that luxury of like a long drying time like you do with oils, where you like literally keep working back into the same area. If you're painting with acrylic, you really have to layer them. So it's like you'll do, you know, like I did one base layer for the face and then I'm going to have, I'm doing some subtle blending here in the eye makeup area, but then I might do a layer on top of that, you know, make it darker, make it lighter. So I use lots of translucent layers to um, build up to the final basically. So I don't, I don't have to have it worked to perfection on the first go. Um, which you you could do that you could paint more of like a wet into wet technique but you'd have to be very quick and efficient about it which would be uh, probably a little bit stressful and it probably you'd be fighting the medium the whole way um, anyway I hope that helps I do like I mean as far as brushes most of mine are a bit abused at the moment but I do like um, like flat flat brushes I do use those a lot especially for lines I like these um, angled ones a lot because I can get a really um, smooth clean edge with those uh, it's I don't know it just kind of takes practice honestly and you have to learn kind of when um, to stop working the medium because sometimes if you overwork uh, when it starts to dry um, you can get that kind of chunkiness and that's something I've really had to kind of learn to have some patience with because it's like okay I did a layer now um, you know blend it a little bit quickly kind of how I'm doing here and then leave it alone because there, there definitely becomes in a few minutes even five minutes maybe even less it will start to dry a little bit and then you're going to start lifting it and then you're going to get like chunkiness um, it's just kind of something that takes practice and again maybe acrylic isn't the way for you to go if you really want smoothness if you really want smooth transitions oils or aqua oils might be a better choice for you because you might not have to um, kind of uh, like fight it as much although I do like the drawing time on these especially when like I have a show coming up or a deadline and I'm like okay I don't have a month for this to dry so I'm gonna have to just go for it and uh, keep layering and letting it dry because that just kind of works better for me um, but experiment and be kind to yourself as you learn because nobody ever got it right the first time and if they did then I hate that person <laughs> okay um uh, next I have a question from Brianna Rosler sorry it's a long long name Brianna Brianna I'm gonna call you how do you find inspiration for creativity over uh, over the frustration of life I struggle with that often um well, it's, it's funny that you should say that since, you know, I'm here today and I kind of like uh, filled you guys in on a little bit on how sometimes, man, it is hard. Sometimes life just like kind of like smacks you in the face and you're like, you know what? <laughs> this is just not working for me. And it, sometimes it's okay, I think, to give yourself a break and, and take some time to kind of mentally heal and don't try to force it if it's just not happening. Um, but I also think that, like I've, I also think that I have paint all over my fingers right now. <laughs> I also think that sometimes you gotta just cleanse your space and say, okay, I'm just gonna clean slate this, no pressure, I'm gonna just create something for me. Oh God, um, maybe don't think about like oh this is going to go on my social media this is something i have to sell uh try to like get that out of your mind and just say i'm just gonna you know give myself an hour i'm gonna sit here for an hour and if i make something i i make something if i if i'm just too
too frustrated and I can't do it right now, then step away. And I think that's okay to do. Um, like I said, lately I've been like kind of like having physical stuff where I, I don't like feel that great like sitting in one position for a long time. So I'm like, well, you know, I'll sit here as long as I can. Then I'll go play video games for a, a while and I'll, I'll take a walk. Um, but I think the most important thing is just to be like, I'm going to set a little bit of time aside to try again. I have to set that time for yourself and don't worry about it having to mean anything or be anything. I mean, this, this particular piece is a commission. So it's, there's a little bit of pressure on me to do this for, you know, my client and everything, but it's also something I'm, I'm enjoying painting. So I'm kind of like, I'm really excited to kind of get back to that and, and get it, um, get it to a finish. So for me, I, I kind of was like, I have this piece already waiting for me, but I know sometimes it's kind of hard when you don't, I'm, I'm very assignment based, so it helps me to have an assignment. I've always been sort of type A personality like that. Like if something, there's something um, for me to do, I'll get in and I'll finally do it. Um, but I know sometimes when you're like, okay, I'm between paying jobs or I just do art as a hobby. Sometimes it's like, ah, I'm just not really inspired by anything. And then sometimes you gotta look outside of like, you know, what typically inspires you and just, you know, go to a museum, go to the library, do something that you don't usually do. I do find sometimes like just looking through Instagram and like trying to get inspired, that sometimes makes me feel worse. Cause I'm like, oh, everybody's better and faster and more popular than me now. And so I'll put my phone down, I'll be like, okay, well I feel worse than when I started. So maybe break that habit if that's something that kind of like gets you um, nowhere, then try other things. Say, I'm gonna like redesign my favorite m movie character or my favorite book character or make some little challenge for yourself. Just, just do a sketch, you know, start small. So I don't know if that helps. I'm still trying to figure this stuff out myself, honestly. <laughs> I know it's rough sometimes. This is like, ugh, I don't feel like doing anything but sleeping and like going to the fridge every few hours. <laughs> so baby steps, you know, but we are in this, in this struggle together. Just know that. Um, your boy wonder wants to know what colors do you prefer to paint with? If any, um, that depends on my mood. Honestly, it depends on my mood. It depends on, um, the mood of the piece. I, I do, I am a little more attracted to cool colors. I can't lie. Like, I love this like blue palette um, with like turquoises, turquoises, and um, um, this like kind of lavender in the skin tone. I do really like this palette. I, I painted it kind of a similar palette in, in this piece that I did recently. I love this cool palette with like the little bit of like the warmth in the, the face. I, I definitely am attracted to that, especially right now. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I've enjoyed painting with all types <coughs> of colors. Gesundheit. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> okay. Um, I enjoy painting with all the colors of the wind. All the crayons in the crayon box. Because I think almost, um, I mean, I love painting with rainbow in general. Um, but you guys know, I think I have pretty much the full spectrum of colors in my pieces. I have some that are very warm, all oranges, greens. Um, I don't know. So I really don't, I'm not that like, I don't do a lot of earth tones. As you guys have probably noticed, um, not a lot of earth tones because I just love saturated color so much. Um, not a lot of like um, black and white or like monochromatic. Um, but I don't know, I've been feeling kind of like gloomy lately. So I actually did these, um, oh, they're not near me right now, but I did some paint pours just cause like, actually when I was talking about like looking for inspiration when you're just feeling kind of crappy, I just was pouring paint and just like smearing it around. And um, I really got some interesting um, effects with that. And I was using like grays and black and, and blue. And I was like, this is kind of different for me. It really came out kind of like, moody and like spooky almost so I guess I was like reflecting my mood but anyway I hope that answers that for you okay um J Moore deranged oh oh <laughs> what's been your favorite event this year hope I didn't miss this you didn't miss this you're just in time my favorite event this year 
Well, I got to go to Hawaii actually twice this year, which is kind of like a fluke thing. Um, but that, that was great. That happened kind of before all this other drama. So I got to enjoy some really wonderful beach time and family time and Mai Tai time. And I still, I think a little bit tan actually. Um, so that, that was good. Hawaii is one of my favorite places. Uh, actually it was one of my favorite, uh, my parents' favorite places since they got engaged there. Hence why I'm named Leilani. Um, they loved Hawaii so much that, uh, they gave me a Hawaiian name. So when I go there, there's a bunch of stuff I can buy with my name on it. So that's always enjoyable for me. Um, this is not, not really an event, but like kind of. Um, I wasn't able to go to Disneyland, um, but my assistant was in Disneyland, Tessa. You guys all say hey to Tessa. She's been very helpful uh, this last recent few months when I've been a little bit down. She's been filling my orders for me and everything. Um, but she took some prints with her to hide at uh, California Adventure Park at Disneyland this last weekend and um a totally fluke happening but some of you guys know this um that i am a big fan of raven from rupaul's drag race oh. Ooh. i'm giving quintessential raven and it turns out that raven is a big fan of mine which is totally like a, a fluke happening she loves disney and uh, Wonderground Gallery. So she found my art at Wonderground, I think a couple years ago now. And so now her and her gorgeous boyfriend, um, who I'll say, give a shout out to um, too, um, they are like collectors of mine. So they have several of my pieces and they came and met me uh, last year when I was at Wonderground, which was totally like a surprise thing. I didn't know they were coming in or anything. Um, and Raven, whose boy name is David, was like, oh, hey, Leilani. And I was like, hey, like, what's up? <laughs> um, so like they hung out with me for a while. Anyway, long story short, um, so I have, when I do the art drops at Disneyland, I ask the people like, take a picture with it and post it to Instagram so I know that the prints got found. If you guys don't know about the art drops, check check it out on my Instagram. It's a cool little thing that um, some people started to hide art around Disneyland. Anyways, so Raven found one of my art drops and posted a picture on her Instagram and on her story. And was like, hey, I found your art. I'm at Disneyland today. And I was like, oh my God, this is so surreal. Um, anyways, if you guys don't know who she is, check her out. Honestly, I feel like I've been painting faces inspired by her, like, since I first saw her on Drag Race, like, oh God, 10 years ago now? Um, she was my longest favorite queen and, and actually why I started watching Drag Race because I remember like she was on and I was like, oh my God, who is that? They're the most beautiful person I've ever seen. Anyway, she found my daisy print and she was like, oh, I'm going to do a look inspired by this. So, oh my God, cross your fingers that that happens because like I can die happy. <laughs> Seriously. I also want to give a special thank you and shout out to Paul and Melissa, who also found uh, three of my five art drops. And you guys are so awesome. You went out there and braved the rain for this. So I just want to give you guys a, a mega shout out and thank you too. Okay. Anyway, sidebar. Um, Grandma Soul. Hello. Grandma Soul is back. It's good to hear from you again. Um, is there any theme, concept, muse for a painting that you desperately want to paint but haven't found the time to get around to it yet? Oh, that's a, always a good one. I love that. I always have like 10 different ideas going around in my head at, at any given moment. Um, so yeah, let me think about that because Frida was one of those forever and I finally got around to painting her and I actually really love how that piece came out. Um, but honestly, something on my list lately is I've wanted to do like a paint this again. I'm going to try this lip color. It might not be right, but oh yeah. So something that I've been wanting to kind of do is one of my, so oddly enough, one of my most popular print sellers, um, maybe not so much anymore, but used to be, was the Three Fates paintings I did. And they were like these little tiny, they were on these little tiny wood like blocks so they couldn't really even be that detailed and I don't even think they reproduced that well uh, but everybody just really loved that theme and I love that theme too like 
and I really would like to kind of redo them justice, redo them. Uh, maybe all three in one painting instead of um, uh, three separate paintings, because that would certainly be uh, challenging to do three characters in one piece. So that's like one I've wanted to get back to. I don't know what you guys think. Um, I've pulled people before, like, you know, on my Patreon and stuff, like, what would you like me to do next? Because I definitely wanted to get back to doing, like, Sailor Moon characters, because I just, those are one of my biggest influences. But, like, I just never seem to get back around to it. Um, but I definitely have a list of a few more I'd like to do. And if you wanna, if you wanna vote on these themes, I often post these these theme votes to my Patreon subscribers, and they actually get like a say. So I did uh, the last one I did that fairy queen was because that was something that they voted on. So it's kind of fun to actually like uh, get some input on my next painting. But I'm not sure. I have quite a few. Um, like commissions lined up and some new Disney work I have to do. So I'm not sure when I'll have another open theme, but we'll see. Okay, so her mouth just looks like she's like sucking on a lemon. I gotta widen that out a little bit. But what's kind of cool now is I am starting to kind of see, so my face inspiration for this character is a model and actress named Abby Lee Kershaw. And she just, I don't know, I'm obsessed with her looks. She has this kind of like, almost like alien look to her. I love like the kind of like wide set eyes. I always kind of paint that in my characters, but she like literally looks like this. And um, she also just kind of has this like strong look about her. I know she's got these great cheekbones and everything. So I definitely want to bring a little bit of that likeness back in as we go here. Okay, next I have a question from Catnip Lorraine. Hello, Kate. How are you? Nice to hear from you. Um, and she asked today, I noticed you pinning Apple cosplays. I will be so excited if you follow through on that one. This is my gnome stick. Okay, so for those of you guys who don't know what she's talking about, um, she's referring to a movie that I love called Turbo Kid. And you are correct, Kate. I'm actually considering doing a cosplay of Apple for my next Halloween costume. I love that character and that weird, quirky little movie. So I had some stuff on my Pinterest. I'm trying to figure out how to find the jumpsuit. Like the jumpsuit seems to be one of the harder elements to come by and I'm not really like a good enough sewer to make one myself. So if you come across uh, any jumpsuits that are like that kind of like aged denim, let me know. But yeah, I'll keep you posted. I definitely would love to make the gnome stick, especially. You guys should check out this movie on Netflix, Turbo Kid. Um, I actually did a painting as well, Turbo Girl, which is inspired by Apple, the character that I'm thinking of dressing up as. Okay, um, next I have a question from Laughing Andy. And Laughing Andy says, what are your top tips for drawing faces? Uh, this is always a popular question. I actually, one of my most watched YouTube videos is my Ramona Flowers face drawing tutorial, which in hindsight could use some improvement. Um, but the short answer is, um, you know, focus on proportions first and details later. I think a lot of people, when they're drawing portraits especially, get very caught up in wanting to draw the eyelashes and the eyeball and all of that. And it actually doesn't really improve if you don't have the proper proportion and structure in place to begin with. So you want to kind of plan out um, where your facial features are going to go, use traditional portrait drawing techniques, and then you can always stylize later. Once you learn how to draw the face in more of a traditional sense, you can always kind of um, exaggerate and do more of a caricature if you want to. So yeah, that would be my biggest tip is focus on proportions first, um, then, you know, interpreting the likeness of the person you're drawing. So is their mouth a little wider or their eyes a little smaller? You know, those things that make them unique. And then worry about shading and details and eyelashes at the very, very end when you have all of the um, foundation laid down. 
Okay, next up, I've got a question from Emily Lau 29 and oh, it looks like my camera like cut out here. So I don't know what happened to my visual, but I'll just keep answering and painting. Okay, Emily asks, any tips on how to approach galleries to get your work seen? I've seen, uh, I've been working on call for artist submissions, but was wondering if there is a better or different approach. Um, this is kind of an interesting question. And honestly, I, I have to be honest, I don't, I'm kind of one of those people that um, fell sort of ass backwards into most galleries that I've had. I mean, I don't really, like a lot of them have invited me um, and I haven't done a whole lot of submitting to galleries, honestly. And, you know, my biggest advice would be is to honestly like start small. Like I know it's like you have your dream galleries that you would love to get in, but a lot of times you're competing against tons of artists and they only take submissions through email now most galleries do not let you come in and meet them and show their portfolio they just don't have the time so i mean start with coffee shops start with boutiques or consignment stores or any place that might do a little art show for you because honestly that is how i started and I met a lot of people that way. I also, like I've said before, I did a lot of street fairs and any kind of thing where I could just pop up my shop and put my art out there. And I honestly met people that ended up inviting me to be part of bigger shows and um, smaller galleries and then bigger galleries. Um, Wonderground Gallery, which I get asked about a lot, I actually uh, was invited to. They don't have any kind of submission process. So it was just their, um, their curator was looking for artists that had unique styles. So, I mean, I think a bigger focus is always to improve your product, um, before you really worry about like getting seen, because once you have something unique and, um, you know, polished there, people will come to you. And I think a lot of these top galleries, they're looking for artists with kind of a bigger following. They kind of want to draw that in. So when you're just starting out, don't worry about that too much. Just dip your toe in the water and see if you can get your art out there. So if that, hopefully that helps because you never know who might see your work locally in the, the local coffee shop and say, hey, I know a gallery owner. I'm going to be in a show. Um, the other great thing, um, sidebar, is meeting other artists because you never know. Like um, how I got involved with Gallery 1988 was a fluke thing because um, I'm a big fan of Cuddly Rigor Mortis. Uh, her name is Kristen. And she is also a fellow Wonderground artist. So we kind of followed each other back and forth. And she ended up curating a show for Gallery 1988. She does a lot of work with them. So she just sent me an email. I was like, hey, love your art at Wonderground. Would like to know if you'd like to be part of this show. So networking and getting to know people is a much better way than really just waiting for an email and being sort of a faceless submission. So think of it that way. Get out and meet people and um, just just try whatever you can in your local area and see how that works for you. Okay, uh, next I have a question from Kucha Coloring Works, Inc. Have you seen Handmaid's Tale? Yes, um, I've seen the first season and part of the second season, although I, I have to say the show, I love the setup and I think it's really interesting and kind of well done and very disturbing, but it just, in my opinion, they kind of lost their way and they didn't know what to do with it or the characters at a certain point. And to me, it just became very repetitive and... I just, I kind of, uh, I'm not probably going to watch it anymore, honestly. I'm just kind of over it. But, eh, started strong, then got weak for me. Okay, my next question comes from Acer Art. Hello, Acer Art. How are you? It's good to hear from you again. Um, so their question is, what type of person would you recommend for the West Coast? Could you see yourself moving somewhere else? Love your work. Uh, you've inspired me to really apply myself to the arts in the first place, so thank you. Oh, thank you. That means a lot to me to hear that. Um, I This is an interesting question, but I'm actually, I'm going to let my husband weigh in on this a bit because he is from the East Coast who moved to the West Coast. I've been here all my life, so I, I'm not like a great person for that question because I literally don't know. Um, but you, Brian, you've lived in East Coast, Midwest, and, yeah. and West Coast. So I don't know. What would you say about that? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Type it's of kind person. of a broad question. It is, yeah, it is a broad question. Um, I guess I can just kind of speak from my experience and then just experience of living out here. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I grew up in North Carolina and I was born in Florida and I went to school in Ohio. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I got, um, yeah, like, so my mom's side of the family, they're, she's from Ohio, from the Cincinnati area. And um, my dad's from Pennsylvania, so I, I've kind of sort of have a bit of an eclectic um, sort of yeah. perspective of, like, you know, the different personalities and, you know, um, going from, like, the southern sort of hospitality and sort of the Midwest sort of laid back vibe to the West Coast um, took some getting used to, I yeah. would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, like... I, I moved out here with like hardly, like not, not a whole lot of money. I, I just had a little bit of savings. And even when I moved out here, the cost of living is very different than, yeah, than what it is now. I think so it's true, I would say true. like moving out to the West Coast now, I would definitely take into consideration the cost of living. Um, would definitely recommend having some savings. Yeah, you'd have um, to. Would... Like, so I moved out here for a job. Right. And um, the job that I moved out here for was um, very entry level. So I was moving out here with the hopes that I would move up and actually become a salaried yeah, artist. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so, yeah, when I moved out here, it was $14 an hour. Yeah. It was just a little bit more than minimum wage. Right. And I got coffee for people. <laughs> yeah, hey, man, I got coffee for people, too. But even even then, I didn't, I, I couldn't really afford anywhere to live. I was supposed to have a, a roommate. I would definitely say um, yeah. someone who is um, open to roommates would would be a good thing yeah but like but, my sister has six roommates and pays a thousand yeah so, so just, well that's in san francisco yeah so they live francisco, in a night like a nice house city, yeah yeah you're gonna i mean that's the most expensive city in in the country it is yeah it's so, crazy and and, yeah. and like someone asked me a question earlier they said they'd just been here and they had like a really like negative experience <laughs> and they stepped over needles and gross stuff so yeah, it's like you know culturally it's there's, sad there's, there's, there's it really is a little is. bit of culture shock for sure yeah um you know like i would definitely say the the California vibe is is a bit different. Um, I, I would say um, it's it's also still a melting pot. There's a lot oh, of people much that so. move yeah. to the Bay Area. We've met from literally all, all types of people um, from all different countries. Like most of our friends are like yeah, very mixed. Like from different countries. Well, from I would definitely different... say when it's it comes to cool. the art community, I don't know if yeah. uh, this particular person is an artist. And yeah, considering moving to the she, West Coast for the art community. Yeah. Um, the art community is great. It's yeah, flourishing. definitely. Um, why we're very we love it here. Yeah. Um, it's it's a very tight knit community of uh, very true of friends from all different backgrounds and countries that have moved out to the West Coast for opportunities. So yeah, um, yeah, like meeting meeting a bunch of you know like lifelong friends out here has been amazing. Yeah, so. very very true. But, yeah, I don't know. We haven't really explored, I mean, we've talked loosely about living in other places like uh, Japan or New Zealand or something. We had a really good experience there. But, I mean, moving moving that far would be... That, that's quite a uh, uh, Very commitment. challenging, and yeah. moving to another country for sure is... Um, and you can't really just do that. You have to, like, either have a job there or, like, Japan's very strict about it. Yeah. You know? Um, I don't know about New Zealand though. It seems like they're like, yeah, come over. <laughs> we're, we're we're open. That's pretty cool. Although New Zealand's really expensive. Yeah, New Zealand was, was like shocked. shockingly um, expensive. We're like, we thought like, we knew expensive. Like a twelve hundred square foot flat would be like if you wanted to buy it, it was like one point two, one point three million. Oh, good offline. lord! Yeah, so that doesn't help us too much. Yeah, truly, they're they're getting popular now too. Um, all right, well, hopefully, I think we answered that. Cool. I think we answered that thoroughly. All right, now I'm going to, just to switch up our view a little bit, I'm going to start blocking in this necklace, this cool neck piece I have here. I found some really cool, like, um, old, like, Viking um, female costumes and um, uh, jewelry and things like that, and they have these really cool metal work and, like, engraved jewelry so i'm gonna kind of try to 
emulate that a little bit. Um, we'll see. I found some cool reference where I don't have it um, right next to me right now. But I'm going to just block it in with the same kind of warmish gray I used on the crown. And then I'll go back in and do the details later. Okay, um, my next question comes from Lady Romy. Lady Rumi. Romy. Lady Romy. <laughs> what are your favorite albums to jam to while painting? Your Starry Night piece is up in my office. It's under my Van Gogh and it keeps me inspired while I paint my own work. Oh, thank you. That means a lot to me. I, um, so it's funny that Starry Night piece, I swear to God, like that was one of those pieces I, I don't know, I did it in probably a couple hours, one, one sitting really. And I was like, oh, this is kind of a cute little idea. And I have, I've seriously sold more prints of that than anything, I think. It's just very, like, popular. I think it's just because it's, like, it's something, like, people are familiar with. And as Van Gogh fans, it's just, like, I don't know, kind of, like, a different spin on it. I didn't really mean for it to be, like, that popular or anything. Um, although I did, it, this is funny, I came across it on, um, on on Pinterest and you know how you can be like okay I, I tried this or whatever it literally got repainted by people like thousands of times and uh, of course my name has been completely lost and none of them really gave me any credit so I was like oh that's great that everyone liked my painting and then everybody made copies of it and uh, never uh, gave me any cred but yeah and actually I saw someone who got it tattooed on themselves by a pretty prominent tattoo artist, and the tattoo artist didn't credit me either. I'm like, that's my idea! That's my Van Gogh girl. But anyways, so if you see anybody, police them for me. Uh, anyways, okay, so her question was, what are your favorite albums to jam to? So I, I'm like more of a playlist person than an album person, and I love to um, actually make themed playlists like for each painting that I do. So like actually this painting has an album called Snow Queen and just for fun I'll tell you some songs on that playlist so you can kind of like get an idea of the mood of this piece but um, I like like uh, I love soundtracks a lot especially ones that have like the right mood to them that kind of like matches uh, the painting that I'm doing at the time okay so on my Snow Queen playlist though if you would like to add any of these to your playlist um, is Mad Woman by Sevdaliza Sev Daliza, uh, In Trucks by Glass Animals Once Upon a Dream from Maleficent by Lana Del Rey uh, New Ways by Daughter Hubris, again, by uh, Sevdaliza. I have several Sevdaliza songs. I think I'm saying that right. They're really cool. They're just like the right mood for this piece. Um, so that's my uh, that's my current playlist for this particular painting. So it's kind of fun. I like to kind of create a playlist based on moods that uh, kind of like just fit the theme, right? Okay, next question comes from Cookie Cutter Planner. How are you, Cookie Cutter? Always oh, nice to hear from you. And she says, I think you're a she. I'm an artist who's trying to make her art. Oh, she is a she. I'm an artist who's trying to make my art big. I know you may have answered it multiple times, but I may have to ask, how can I get my work out there when it is not conventional? I do mostly pop surrealism, and everyone I talk to likes my realistic pieces even more, and though I do them rarely. I just want to ask how... Can you get people to like your art without having to conform to what everyone likes? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I'm going to start that answer by saying, like, I, I, I think a lot of people, like, just laymen in general, they often get hung up on, like, the correctness of art. Like, you know, you see all those, like things on Facebook or whatever, and they have a million views of someone who did a perfectly photorealistic portrait using a ballpoint pen. And it's like, you know, that's an amazing skill, but like, it is interesting to me how like people are so much more impressed by the technical aspect. I mean, unless you really have an eye for like, you know, design or you have like a certain taste, but I do feel like the layman really does measure the value of someone's talent by how realistic they can render. And I mean, I'm here to tell you, I don't like doing that. I've found my own taste levels have evolved um, to being, you know, definitely more comic book anime, cartoony inspired 
to a little bit more realism. I do like to bring a little bit more rendering. My proportions have gotten more realistic. Um, and that's just kind of my own personal taste level. But I definitely don't think that you should do art. I definitely don't think you should do art, you know, because some person says, well, I like that type of art. I mean, that's, that's always going to get you stuck in a place where you don't want to be. Um, so, but I will, on another side of the coin, I will say that it is, I, I am an advocate for um, traditional art training. I do think it helps you in the long run to know you know, basic proportion, to know figure drawing, to know value and, and some lighting skills because I, I always, I'm kind of in that park of like know the rules so that you can break them because I just think that m gives you more to work with. Like don't use style to cover um, your lack of technical technique, you know what I mean? I think that can be a trap and just say, well, this is easier um, so I'm going to do it this way, uh, not necessarily because um, that's what you want from your art, but just that you don't feel confident because you haven't practiced and you haven't learned that skill yet, uh, if that makes sense. That's probably a little bit of a gray way of answering it. But as far as like getting big and, you know, getting that type of exposure, I mean, don't uh, never copy someone because you think that'll make you popular. I, I definitely don't think that works. And I, I think that those, and there's a lot of people that do this and I would never name names, but I do see a lot of certain types of art that's replicated a lot. But I think you then you get yourself in a trap of you're always going to be compared to that person that did that first. You know what I mean? It's like you see, I do see a lot of people inspired by Jasmine Beckett Griffith specifically, the very big baby face, and it's like, but I'm always going to think of Jasmine, or I'm always going to think of Keen, or I'm always going to think of that person that really got well known for that, and then you're just sort of, unless you're bringing something new to it. I mean, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's bad to be like, oh, I have several influences that kind of create a new style. I think that's totally fine, but I do think it's dangerous to kind of try to get into the art scene by doing something that's currently popular. Don't train yourself that way. Um, give yourself the basis, basic skills and then say, okay, well, what is my taste? What is my point of view? What do I want to say with my art, you know? So just think of it that way. And you can't concentrate, you really can't worry about like, how do I get known? That's just doing good work, truly. I, I wasn't really focused on that when I started. I really had no idea where I'd end up or where any of this would lead, per se. Um, but I just was kind of like, okay, I just want to like keep bettering my craft. And where that takes me, you know, who knows? I was like, I'm just open to learning. And I think there is some danger nowadays especially because I when I started there was no Instagram I mean Facebook was very new I mean I'm dating myself here but there wasn't so much focus on like I'm not getting likes I'm not getting seen I'm not getting big on Instagram but I still don't think you should make that your goal like because honestly if you start doing something fresh and innovative and you have a good point of view and you keep trying to outdo yourself people will notice like it's just kind of how it is I'm sure most big artists would say that they just started putting themselves out there and doing something unique and you will get noticed for that I mean a lot of people ask me well how do I get my art into Wonderground Gallery like how do like you know I'm, I'm doing Disney art and I'm doing things to get noticed and the number one thing I tell them is don't do Disney art because they actually don't look for that they look for artists that have a very unique style and point of view and um, I don't think any of the artists they've hired were Disney fan artists. They want someone that's going to bring a unique perspective to the existing Disney characters. They don't want to see someone who can just emulate their characters that they already have. I mean, maybe if you want to do like the um, sketch artist type of thing, that might be different. But most of the people there are coming in from a very like unique style and point of view. And yeah, so anyways, broad strokes, that's the, the answer for that. Not broad strokes. I gave you a lot of, a lot of information. Um, Jen Ark is back. Hello, Jen. How are you, my dear? Uh, hi, Leilani. Since coming so far in your art and finding your art style, do you ever look back at your old artwork and want to work on them again now that you've improved so much? 
yeah, that's a great question. I kind of answered that earlier because um, someone asked me about, like, what do you want to paint? And I'm like, yeah, I have some themes that I would kind of, like, maybe want to return to even. Because, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pretty harsh critic on my own art. And I see stuff, I'm like, God, that sucks. And some of it's like, it still sells well. Even though I'm like, I don't feel that represents me anymore. But, you know, if someone is... Uh, touched by it or inspired by it, then who am I to judge, you know? But yeah, absolutely. Um, the one in particular, like I said, was the, the Three Fates painting. I think I might try to revisit that theme because I just, I love that kind of storyline and I like, I like being inspired by Greek myths and stuff. Like, those are um, uh, always fun to interpret because they're kind of open, it's like, okay, like, you can do anything you want, they're, they've been around so long, so yeah, definitely, definitely, um, so, um, I, I don't know, I might have to think about some other ones that might be, um, fun to, to revisit, um, Blue Nando, hello Blue Nando, Blue Nando says, drawing anime is forbidden inside my college art department, yikes, uh, most professors argue that students who can only draw anime don't improve their technical skills or develop a unique style since they only copy what they see and refuse to go outside their comfort zone. What are your thoughts as an established professional artist who also happens to draw inspiration from anime? I uh, remember that in college. Yeah, me too. Um, and in my college, my teacher called it Japanime, which was really funny. Yeah. I don't want to see any of that Japanime, I remember. And I also, I feel that because I, I definitely came from a place of, I mean, I was draw, like drawing my own manga, like inspired, like my drawing style was very stuck in that. I was drawing Sailor Moon all the time and that's kind of like how I was teaching myself to draw. Um, but first I want to say this. I don't like that manga and anime get such a bad rap because you probably know this. There's some really freaking good drawings oh, in yeah. anime and manga and it's beautiful and it's all done by like manga anyway is like usually done by one person and who will draw 10 volumes or 12 volumes of a comic. So I'm like, I just think like downplaying that or calling it mean, lowbrow um, is insulting. You I know? think teachers have like a very stereotypical like idea of what anime yeah, is. Yeah, like Dragon because, Ball. Because like, they or... wouldn't consider like Studio Ghibli style to be a part of that. As but, true, very true. They shouldn't. They shouldn't, <laughs> yeah. That's, like, I mean, the most those backgrounds, if you beautiful. were a background artist working for Studio Ghibli, you'd be yeah. like, they only accept the best like gouache artists Absolutely. in the world for that. They were so. just hiring recently, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I, uh, I would just say, like, I mean... From my from my perspective is that um, if you're going to be paying for school, yeah, you might as well learn like the foundations and yeah, I and, was saying that earlier, but like it's sort of like if you're going to do the full four years, yeah, the first year should be foundations. So picking a school that you know, I think has they're a they're already program. in it school. It sounds like they're already yeah. in the school, but but it does get to a point where you do have to start thinking of how your work's going to be professionally yes, accepted because yeah. like my senior year there was a lot of students that were still like doing it as homework assignments yeah they were still in the mindset of homework assignments and that was like the final semester they were still thinking like that yeah and it's like you you're you're supposed to have a portfolio <laughs> well, I, mean, I think it's kind of like what I said on the last question. I was like, I do think it's dangerous to learn specifically just copying. So, I mean, although I think there's a lot you can learn from drawing anime, I certainly improved just copying, like, ch challenging poses. There's always different challenging figure drawing and stuff in, 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 like, manga and stuff. But, yeah, I think you, it's important to learn those foundations because, because anime and manga artists... I can assure you come from traditional drawing. They know how to draw the figure. They know how to draw proportion, perspective. I mean, those are things they yes. learn traditionally and then they draw in an anime style. Yeah. So even them, they're not just, I mean, for the most part, as far as I know, aren't just learning drawing from drawing other it's, anime. Um, thinking of it as you, know? uh, you want to ask less permission for every mark you make. Yes. Like as you grow as an artist, 
if you're looking at how other artists do things, right. you're, you're essentially asking permission to make marks based on another artist's yeah. marks. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. And the interpretation of style. Yeah, very true. And I think that can trap you a little bit yeah. as far as, yeah, developing a unique style because you're, I mean, and again, there's nothing wrong with being inspired by it. There's a lot of manga influence in my paintings for sure. But I have try, I have wanted on a personal level to shift away from that a little yeah. bit um, to create something that's a little more unique to me. But it's in there for sure, mm -hmm. and I still love it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you, I mean, you you can't get past your influences. And no, that's a good and thing you, that you, you don't have want influences. To. Yeah, uh, every artist does. I mean, there's certain things that people gravitate towards. You you will like things inherently. Yeah. There'll be reasons why you want to do art and it's yeah, because exactly. of other art. Me too. I so mean that's why I want to. So you will have other do. influences. It's just that you don't want to keep referring back to the same shallow pool of yeah. art. Yeah. Yeah. There's very a true. lot of art out there. Yes. So the more pools you can you know dip into you're going to have a much more unique kind of voice. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I tell my students in my class, I actually have an assignment where they have to come up with 10 artists. And I say, and try to choose 10 artists that are not similar to each other. 10 artists that inspire you that do different kinds of art and may inspire you for different reasons, right? Like you like their color theory or you like this person's um, way they do figures. You like this person's backgrounds. You like this person's painting style. Um, because I think that really helps kind of break that because, you know, I... I get asked this, you know, Brian gets asked this a lot because he's an artist as well. It's like, how do you find that style and how do you find that unique personal voice? And I think it's really just you keep picking cherries and putting them in your basket and you start to kind of say, oh my gosh, finally, <laughs> here's a cooking example. It's going to make a pie that's uniquely you, you know? So I think, anyways, getting getting back to your question a little bit, it's just... Take that with a grain of salt a little bit when they say that. Like, don't be afraid by that. That scared me a lot when my teacher said that. I don't want to see any Japan anime because I was like, oh, God, can I get away from that? Because that's what I came in with. I mean, like I said, once you're a bit more free of the art school confines, you can explore that. You can go back to your early influences. I think that's actually kind of a refreshing way after you've been trained to do something exactly how they want you to do it is to revisit some of those reasons why you got into art. So don't worry about it. But they are trying to teach you something valuable. They're trying to break habits. They're trying to teach you to observe how to interpret form and the figure in a classical way. And that's what you're paying for. So, you know, and then in your free time, draw on your sketchbook however you want. But you will see, I think, if you listen to your teachers and stay true to yourself, those things will blend at a certain point, you know? So hopefully that, that helps you a little bit. Um, Tales of Peter, how long did it take you to find your art style? I'm still working on finding mine. Um, I kind of talked about this throughout this paint along, honestly, and it's a work in progress and it's always changing and evolving. It's like, it's, I don't think, maybe for some artists, it's like, damn, that's it you know, stamp it and cement and I've decided that's my art style, but I don't, I don't think that's like that for most artists. I think, and if it is, it's, I don't know, that would be boring to me. I always want to kind of like keep developing my, my taste and my style and experiment and I never want to get too trapped in doing the same thing. Exactly. I mean, I feel like right now I, I obviously have things that I like to repeat in my art because I'm like, oh, that worked well last time and I want to even develop that further or try something more challenging. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Just it's a process. It's a process. And I don't I think a lot of people put this like style thing like on a finish line and it's just not like that. It's just, you know, like, OK, I did this. I liked this about it. I didn't like that about it do another one, do another one, you know, do another one. And then eventually I'll start to see that that kind of comes out naturally, I think. I had to switch to my phone cam because my card's full, but this probably looks better than my camera, which is ridiculous at this point. Okay, so moving on to my Facebook questions. My first Facebook question is from Dana. My dear Dana, how are you? AKA my soul sister. She know she knows about that little inside joke we have. <laughs> Anyways, um, so she asked me today, do you do anything like urban sketching? 
Um, I don't. I used to, when I used to ride the train or the bus more, like and back and forth to work, I used to sketch a little bit then just to like, you know, bide my time. But lately, like I said, I'm kind of like um, more assignment based. So every time I'm drawing or working, it's usually towards some paid assignment. And I wish I was a little bit more of a sketchbook person. But it's it's weird that you know, since arts become my job, I really like to do something else when I'm not working. So I like to play video games or garden or walk or exercise or, you know, whatever. So yeah, as much as I'd like to do more sketching, I, I honestly really don't do much of it uh, these days. Um, okay, next I have a question from Miss Tina Marie. Hello, Tina Marie. Good to hear from you again. Um, she says, I know you like rainbows. Have you ever considered doing a series of girls, each one as a specific color of the rainbow, be it primary or pastel, with its own vibe? I think this would be a phenomenal look on a wall. That was actually what I was going to do as an art book or like kind of like a um like fanciful art book children's book that was kind of like my idea which I don't know hopefully maybe I'll still go back to that but I love I love that idea and I, I have thought about it I've actually written the characters names and like their backstories and everything so yeah it's still on my list so uh, stay tuned I will try to get get back to doing that okay um so after Tina Marie well, do you see a question after that yeah, okay. Victoria Johnston. All right, Victoria, what's your question? Did you always want to be a professional painter or did you dream of being something else as a child and then discovered your ability to paint? Um, well, I knew I wanted to be an artist. I didn't know that I wanted to be a painter. I actually thought um, I was going to be more of a illustrator because I liked... Um, you know, I kind of got into drawing because of like children's books that I liked and I wanted to write and, or, you know, and illustrate them. So that's kind of what I thought when I was a kid. And then I thought, oh, well, yeah, you know, maybe it would be better to, to get a job like in animation or 3D animation. And my parents had a friend that worked at Pixar. So they were like, oh my God, that would be a real job for you to get. So I pursued one summer semester of 3D animation and I hated everything about it and I decided that I didn't want to do that. Um, so I, my degree is in traditional illustration, which is, you know, a fine art degree with a focus on illustration. Um, but I didn't really find out how much I liked painting until like my last year of art school, maybe. I mean, they make you paint a lot in art school with oils and I was like, eh, this stuff stinks and... I wasn't really into that, but I took um, a, you know, I took a elective with Kazu Sano, who I've mentioned before, who was like a master artist. You know who he is. He did the uh, Return of the Jedi uh, poster. Super, super nice guy. Um, he has since passed away, which I'm really sad about. Um, but he taught an acrylic elective p class, and I fell in love with acrylics because of him, honestly. I, I just... I was like, wow, I just never, like, the the type of effects that he would get were crazy. Like, his stuff looked like oil paintings, but it was acrylics. Like, I don't know. And I, that kind of made me fall in love with it. And I just wanted to paint all the time after that. And so, I don't know. That's kind of how I, like, tripped into it. Because I thought I would should probably become a digital fine artist and, or a digital illustrator. And I don't know, that's probably slowed me down or hurt me over the years that I couldn't take more digital work to pay the bills because I decided to do it the hard way. But yeah, to answer your question, I, I, I didn't know. And I didn't even, I didn't even paint as a kid. Did you paint? I didn't really paint. Like paint, paint? Yeah. Paint. Yeah, I mean, I painted with watercolors yeah, sometimes. Um, pencils that turned yeah, the watercolor. Color. Yeah. But I think, Same. I don't know, middle school I started acrylics. Yeah, I did some acrylics in, in um, junior college. It was kind of like a, an elective, but I really did not f learn much about painting at all until art school, and I didn't know how much I would like it because I used to color with colored pencils. That was ma really my main source of coloring as a kid was markers and colored pencils. So, yeah, it was um, kind of late, but and now it's just, I don't know, something about it. I've learned to enjoy it more, actually, like... 
because when you're fighting it less, there's more enjoyment in it. So now I've finally come to a place where I have a little bit more, I mean, I still get mad and I still like have meltdowns <laughs> pretty regularly, but I have figured out a few things that give me a little bit more confidence when I approach it and it, I, I do get more enjoyment than fighting it as much. So <laughs> if that's something that gives you hope to look forward to, um, that would be good. All right. Is that the last one or we have one? No. Um, okay. uh, Emily Lalonde, if I'm saying Lalonde okay. Okay. or Lalonde. Lalonde. Uh, did you see The Last Avenger? Uh, uh, what are your thoughts? The end game or? I think so. Yeah. I, I did. I liked it. I liked it. I, I'm not like, you know, we, we like the Marvel movies. We've seen, I think, almost all of them. Uh, and I, I'm not too harsh of a critic on them because I think it's just like the fact that they can keep any of this organized at this point is an impressive feat to me. So yeah, I, I thought they, I thought they did a good job with it. Um, I was entertained. I was emotional. I, I cried a lot in this last one. Um, we were in a very noisy crowded theater though. Brian was getting very annoyed because there's these teenagers behind us that were just being like complete jerk faces and talking and laughing the whole time but, but yeah I, I thought it was pretty good I, I i thought uh what was the one before endgame oh um infinity war, infinity war. i think i kind of like that one better but yeah, I, 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 I love it i know he's sick he wants them all to be dead he's like i'm happy they're all dead i'm like what's wrong with you weirdo i was like why would you want them to all die i wanted to come back I didn't know that it was going to end like that. Yeah, that was completely. Sound. That <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, um, I was just like, oh, that was so shocking because I just didn't know it was going to be a two-parter. You tricked me. Uh, all right. So is there last question? I feel like we're on the last question. Yes. Last um, question. All right. Let's do this. I've been going full Jude speed today. Barrett. Jude Barrett. Where do you find inspiration? Do you ever find yourself falling into familiar patterns, or do you try to push? For something new each painting I tend to stick to safe and familiar because that's what I enjoy painting but does that in turn squash creative juices oh that's a good question I think I talked about this a little bit today already honestly um, but of course yeah of course there's some things I repeat a lot I mean I, I've been criticized on the interwebs. You paint the same face every time. I'm like, no, they have different eye colors and different hair colors and different attitudes. Okay. Um, but yeah, obviously there are certain aesthetics that I am attracted to. So yeah, I do repeat those things. Um, but like I said earlier, I, I do feel like I, I try to be open-minded when, and I, when I approach a new piece and I try to think of things that, I haven't done exactly, or I, I, I can make a different character. That is definitely one something I want to do. And like in, in this particular case, I kind of talked about this one um, a little bit, but I, I'm trying to work a little bit more of like likenesses, or you know, just to give a little bit of variance to my faces. So like I did have like that one model that I was really kind of looking to for this. Um, because I think that adds like just a little bit of variety. I don't really want all of my girls to be the same character. I, I don't want that. I do want them to be different, but then you still want to like be true to your brand. You know what I mean? You still, you don't want people to go, Oh my God, who did that? I mean, unless you want to, but I, I still like to have some element of my characters in there. You know, it's a balance, I guess, I guess I would say. Um, but as far as like where I find my inspiration, like lots of places. And like I said, I love, I do like assignments because it kind of forces me to like say, well, how do I apply that to my style? Like, um, Sean, who is my client for this, he happens to be a graphic designer, which at first gave me a little bit of pressure. Cause I'm like, okay, so he knows good design. He does have art understanding. So I want to make sure I do a good job, but he was very open. He was like, you know, whatever feels, you know, whatever fits this theme that's also true to your style like go for it so it was a nice challenge to kind of be like okay how do I kind of pool all these inspirations together and I, I kind of think it does that I definitely think there is a, an element of Elsa in there which he liked but he didn't want it to be frozen and I think it's got a strong strong 
you know, female. I like, I always like that. I don't really, like lately I'm like, I'm not really into these like, I mean, sometimes I like to do something a little more demure, mysterious, but I don't know. I just love like a badass, fierce looking character. I don't know. It just appeals to me, you know? Okay, guys, well, that's it for me on this paint along. And sorry about some spotty audio and syncing issues. I had some camera and mic issues. So that's why I actually have no video of this outro. But anyways, thank you for watching. And I hope you guys join me again very soon. If you would like to um, support my shop right now, I'm running a little wellness sale with the coupon code BEWELL. Just, to, you know, if you want to help with some vet bills or my medical bills or just make me smile, buy a sticker or anything helps. Um, anyways, thank you guys again and I'll catch you next time. Do you have a question that you'd like to see answered on a future paint along? Post it in the comments below with hashtag AskLJ or post it to me on my social media, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. See you guys next time.